So the um, thing that I yeah, wanted to uh, talk about today is basically just to give the big picture of where, from at least a technology perspective, Ethereum is uh, going to go over the uh, going to go over the next ten years, right? Um, so, over the last ten years, the um, I think if there's obviously been a lot that has happened in Ethereum development, right? Oh, there we go. Okay, Ethereum in the next decade. Yay! Thank you so much. So, the la Ethereum's last decade, the 2010s, they were focused a lot on solving problems in theory, right? So. First, let's just create a blockchain, any blockchain at all that people can actually use. Let's create a blockchain that has some kind of general purpose programming language so you can you create smart contracts, you can build applications, you can make DAOs, trying to figure out in theory what all of the different applications are, understanding that the scalability problem exists and like thinking through, you know, the Lightning Network, state channels, plasma, roll-ups, sharding, um, just all of the different possible ways of uh, actually uh, of trying to solve that problem. And we did a lot of work in the uh, 2010s, but at the same time, like in the 2010s, the, the, the crypto space has still been, remained fairly small, right? So, I think uh, if we look at even uh, the, uh, even today, right? If we just look at the status quo use uh, of Ethereum usage, in many places, very few people have found uses for Ethereum, aside from trading digital monkeys. Who here has a digital monkey? Interesting. No, woo, no woos this time. Um, so, in a lot of places, right? People's existing financial systems work reasonably well. People's existing identity systems work reasonably well. Why do they need a DAO when they can make LLCs and all of these things, right? And so the number of use cases that a, it, people can see in a lot of contexts is just not very large. But also, in many other places, many people have found uses for Ethereum, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, blockchains already, right? In uh, a lot of uh, countries it's around the world, there's like more than 10% of people have uh, not just heard of cryptocurrency, but are like actually using it and holding it for their own personal savings, right? There are many countries around the world where ex the existing fiat currency is either hyperinflating or it's just not at all connected to global financial systems, or you know there's other there's various political problems, and for a lot of people. Even today, cryptocurrency is a lifeline, whether for making payments or for doing or for savings, or sometimes even for like very basic and primitive DAOs for doing thing, uh, things like business, uh, business and uh, community organizations to, together in groups. So, in many places, many people have found uses for Ethereum, but they're largely using centralized exchanges. Um, so. About at the uh, end of uh, 2021, I visited uh, Buenos Aires, and Buenos Aires is a fascinating city because the, when I walk around on the streets, the rate at which someone on the street recognizes me is higher than in San Francisco. <laughs> you know, there's no other technology or I think of where Buenos, where Buenos Aires uh, you know, beats San Francisco in that way, right? But you know, crypto is it, right? Crypto is uh, you know not the uh, the technology for uh, for one wealthy city in the world. Crypto is uh, you know the technology for the re for for the world. Um, and uh, I was walking around uh, on uh, Christmas Day when a lot of uh, shops were closed, and eventually found one coffee shop that was open. And my friends and I went to get some tea, and uh, the the owner recognized me, and we pay and I paid him in ETH, but. What kind of wallet did he use? He had a Binance wallet, right? So, and this is like actually a pretty common scenario. If you look through countries, whether in Latin America or in Africa or in Southeast Asia, where people are using cryptocurrency and Ethereum today, not because of some ideological reason or because they're part of a community, but to fill this like very deep need that they personally have right now just to economically survive, a lot of the time, they're using centralized exchanges, right? And that's the status quo today. And I think it's easy to understand why people use centralized exchanges. Centralized exchanges are cheap. They have zero transaction fees. 
sending a uh, payment on the Ethereum mainnet at the time that I was in Argentina at the end of 2021. The transaction fee was, uh, I think, somewhere around $5. Uh, but Binance to Binance transfers, instant. So choice exchanges are convenient. You don't have to wait for 12 confirmations. You just, payments are instant. It's, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about, oh, did this transaction get accepted by the network? How long is it going to be? Is it in a block? It's just, uh, you know, it's just instant. And they protect the user from mistakes, right? If you lose your account, you can recover it. You can talk to customer service. They might ask you to submit a passport. They might annoy you, but you can recover it. You're not gonna just lose your money if your house burns down or if you lose your device. So they're convenient, but um, centralized exchanges sometimes fail, right? So who here knows this guy? Okay, once again, no cheering. Um, you know, sometimes you have guys and, uh, you know, they're, they act very professional and they go on panels with important people like Bill Clinton. And, you know, you can trust him. You know, this guy is not going to have double spending relations with your assets. And, you know, then six months later, it turns out that he does, right? So, it, you know, so choice exchanges, they work very, very well until, until one day you wake up and you realize it's not working anymore. And I, crypto, in a lot of ways, is really about like protecting people from systemic risks and like these really kind of tail risks that people people generally do not anticipate, right? Like people mo generally don't anticipate you know their currency hyperinflating. People generally don't anticipate being censored and being um, you know taken off of every major social and financial platform. People you know generally don't anticipate all of their credit cards simultaneously yet yeah, not, wor not working and uh, them still having to buy a plane ticket, which is something that actually happened to me, right? Um, and so the, well, the problem with using crypto in a centralized way is that, well, actually all of those exact same tail risks, they're coming right back, right? And so if we want a really robust uh, crypto ecosystem that actually fulfills its promises, we need to have actual decentralization. But why don't we have actual decentralization yet? Because the decentralized technology is not good enough. And this is basically what I'm really hoping and a lot of people are really trying hard to make sure that we solve over the next 10 years. So what are the problems? Well, the problems are kind of the same as what the problems were five years ago. This is a slide that I gave at a meetup in Taipei back at the end of uh, 2016. And, well, let's uh, look at what were the problems, uh, 2017, what were the problems that I identified back in, uh, in late 2017 when I was visiting Taipei? Privacy. Who here cares about privacy? Um, consensus safety. Who here cares about blockchain consensus not breaking? Um, smart contract safety. Who here cares about their smart contracts not breaking? Scalability, who here does not want to pay $40 transaction fees? Okay, so yeah, it's uh, a lot of alignment on some basic things, right? And like today, the problems that I'm going to talk about basically are these, right? Um, well, we did solve one, right? So Ethereum has uh, moved from proof of work to proof of stake. Now, there's still ongoing challenges in consensus, like there's the challenge of making sure that the whole MEV situation for example, does not lead to consensus, uh, the, the consensus breaking or becoming centralized in some way. There is upgrading the consensus, adding things like single SWOT finality, making it e easier to be a validator, all of these little things, right? But the really big thing, the switch from uh, proof of uh, work to proof of stake, that's done. And I think we as a community really have something uh, very big to celebrate there. But that's still one, right? Um, Another thing that you might notice is that five years ago, I was focusing a lot on uh, smart contract safety. And here, I'm focusing more on user account safety. And I think, uh, I mean, both of these are important. I think the reason why my, uh, my emphasis here is uh, changing a bit is basically that, like, back then, it was still this, like, it was still much less clear what kinds of applications people would want to use. And I think today it's like still somewhat unclear, but I think 
a lot more of the categories have become pretty well defined. And right now, it's a lot easier to do things that you want to do just by reusing code, right? And there's a lot of code bases that have stood the test of time, that have survived for four or five years. And there's definitely this kind of crazy frontier degen space where people still get hacked for $181 million once in a while. But there's like a growing body of uh, you know, applications that people have used safely for a long time. You know, Uniswap, Gnosis Safe. Um, oh, I, I've been told I'm supposed to call it safe now. Um, it's, uh, you know, gotta respect the rebranding. Um, I've, uh, you know, be a lot of just basic infrastructure you know, ERC-20 contracts, you know, wrapped ETH. A lot of things have kind of stood the test of time. They've had even more audits. And the need to write completely new things is like, in my view, a bit lower than before. And, but at the same time, like, user account safety is, I think, as important and I think is continuing to become even more important, right? If you even just think about the simplest use case, using crypto to store assets, like, those assets have to be safe. You can't have mass adoption of a system where if you lose a piece of paper and you lose your phone, you're screwed, right? You can't have you know, mass adoption of a system where if someone hacks into your phone, they can steal all of your money. You can't have mass adoption of a system where if a burglar comes into your house and they happen to open the right drawer and they see the 12 word seed phrase, they can photo it, have an AI app in like half a second, immediately open the wallet and like drain all of your life savings, right? So I think user account safety is like still even today, not nearly good enough. And like even hardware wallets in my view are like far from a, yeah, a perfect solution, right? And so I think the more complex your crypto usage goes, the more smart contract safety is the emphasis. The simpler your crypto usage goes, the more just basic user account safety is the emphasis. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that we've realized over the years is like the really basic use cases of Ethereum are actually really important, right? And like, that's the thing that most people do, you know, just hold coins. Um, who here has like any ETH or any ERC-20 token? Um, who here has used Uniswap? Who here has used uh, some yield farming tool? See, you know, number of hands goes down, right? Um, so it's still important, but like the most basic thing, and especially once you go to like people who you know are really depending on this for their lives, right? It just is you know keeping your assets, being able to make payments, you know, say, uh, you know, holding on to your identity in the future, and just all of this really simple stuff, right? And like without user account safety, nothing else really yeah really works. So let's talk about the three remaining problems, right? So fees and uh, scalability. Using Ethereum or Bitcoin or any other public blockchain with a serious amount of usage is expensive. Um, the, the, the amount of demand for using Ethereum has gone up massively over the last 10 years. The amount of people using the Ethereum L1, or the amount of space that the Ethereum L1 has to use has not gone up. The uh, transactions per, per day has been somewhere between 1 million and 1.5 million for the last three years. Now, the gas limit has gone up, but basically, instead of there being more transactions, we just have more complex transactions. Now, some of this, I think, actually is activity that's moved to layer two, which is good, right? But generally, the Ethereum layer one has not increased in scalability by that much. And the problem is fundamental. When you have a system that every single person needs to verify, that system cannot be more powerful than what you can verify on a single computer, right? And this is a big problem, and it's causing transactions to be expensive for people, but we're making progress. So about three years ago, I uh, wrote this post where I uh, talked about the idea of a roll-up centric roadmap. Basically, using a particular type of layer two scaling solution called a roll-up, as a way of scaling Ethereum. And uh, rollups are systems that are not inside the blockchain, they, but they use the blockchain for security, but they only put a little bit of data into the blockchain. The rest of the data the re and all of the computation happens off-chain. And by doing this, you have systems that have the same level of scalability, or even or actually much higher scalability than Ethereum itself, 
but that don't you but that still have the same level of security, right? So this was a post, and um, at that time, you know, there were a few of these rollups. Since then, there are more rollups. Um, and about half a year ago, I yeah, basically published this post that basically tries to kind of formally classify how mature different ro like different rollups are. Um, stage zero is like basically you know still training stage, and then stage one and stage two are basically when when you do what I call like taking off the training wheels and like actually making the rollup closer to being fully decentralized, and where the security actually does only depend on the technology, right? So it becomes fully trustless. And as of about two months ago, Polygon is uh, our stage one on mainnet. And all of the others, so Optimism, Arbitrum, Scroll, Tyco, ZK Sync. Um, I've been told that if I don't mention Linea, someone's going to get angry. Um, so I'm supposed to mention Linea as well. Um, you know, they're very close behind, right? So, um, a lot, so actually a lot of progress happening. And I think uh, like we can actually see, right, how, you know, with, uh, well, not after the merge was finished, all of the work really switched over to getting scalability working. And we're making huge amounts of progress, right? Five years ago, proof of stake was something that like, you know, the, the, the trolls on Twitter would say, ha ha ha, Ethereum promises proof of stake, but, it'll, but it keeps never happening and it'll never happen. Now we're fully proof of stake. Um, you know, Two years ago, people would say scalability is something Ethereum promised, but ha ha ha, it'll never happen. Now, you know, we're basically on, we have, uh, we actually have, you know, one working, uh, you know, like roll up with actual cryptography running things, and over the next year, we're going to have much more. Um, EIP 4844 is a uh, feature of the Ethereum protocol whose goal it is to create more space on, on, on chain so that rollups can have higher scalability. Not important to understand the details of this, but what is important is that with EAP 4844, rollups will be able to have much more space to store their data. And with future versions of uh, dank sharding, rollups will have even more space, right? And so with all of these technologies stacked together, the amount of transactions per second that the Ethereum blockchain can store will is expected to increase from about 16 to somewhere between 20,000 and 100,000. Right, so actually really huge improvements. So that, in theory, the numbers are really good, right? In theory, rollups give a huge amount of scalability and that's amazing. But let's look at rollup scaling from the user's perspective. We have multiple rollups. So who here has an account on Optimism? Who here has an account on Arbitrum? Who here has an account on the Polygon ZK EVM? Who here has an account on any StarkNet system? Who here has an account on uh, ZK Sync? Linnea. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Bitcoin. Um, Aptos. Uh, Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, the, US, the US dollar. <laughs> Starknet Cairo, yes. Okay. Uh, so a, a lot of people are on a lot of different systems, right? And uh, the, like, the roll-up that you are on might not be the same as the roll-up that other people are on. What if I have coins on, our, on Optimism and I'm trying to pay someone and they're only on Arbitrum? Um, what applications that I want to use, right? So let's say I'm on Optimism and I want to pay you and you might even have an address on Optimism but your ENS name is on Polygon ZK EVM, right? Um, what, you know, what if I'm on, um, you know, Kakarot and I want to put, trade some coin, uh, some coins into a different coin using some, you know, decentralized exchange and that decentralized exchange is on Linnea, right? So there's like a lot of these very concrete user experience challenges. Um, addresses exist, need to exist on multiple rollups. And then there's a lot of these challenges at the level of individual applications. So if you look at ENS, for example, right? ENS currently exists only on Ethereum mainnet. Ethereum mainnet is expensive. Um, if you want to register a new ENS name right now, you're going to have to pay, on top of the registration fee, a transaction fee of like something like $5. 
And you know, if Ethereum becomes much more widely used, then, then that transaction fee might easily become like $200, right? So um, there is this proposal um, called uh, CCIP that ENS is uh, in, you know, actually, you know, has, and people are rapidly integrating. There is um, actually something called OptiNames that is already based on this, and I have one. And I've been told that other Layer 2 projects have very similar things. Basically, you can, what you can do is you can put a domain, uh, an ENS name, into one of these systems, and then users can register subdomains on a Layer 2, and you can use custom code to verify proofs that you own the thing on the inside of the Layer 2 system, right? And so you basically, it's this very permissionless design that allows basically every layer two to be used to register and use ENS names. Now that's really powerful, right? Like it's not just ENS moving to optimism, right? It's ENS moving to every layer two at the same time. So I think this is great. And like, I'm happy that in this, uh, you know, these improvements to ENS are happening, but like there's challenges involved in, you know, actually result, like making sure all of the different infrastructure that we have actually resolves this sort of thing. So that's problem one, scaling. A lot of work is happening and a lot of good technical work is happening, but there's also like this very practical user experience work that needs to be done, right? Of making layer twos as natural and as easy to use as layer one is today. As of today, this is not true, right? Like I have a wallet, I have a wallet on this phone, and uh, I, um, you know, have some amount of ETH on it, but then it's all on mainnet. This wallet does not support any of the any of the layer twos at the moment, right? So things like this need to improve, and they need to improve in a way that does not compromise on the trustlessness and decentralization, censorship resistance, openness, and all of these things that uh, you know we value of the Ethereum layer one. Problem two: user account security. So wallet security is a big problem. Um, this is uh, from an article that I wrote a year ago that quotes a Bitcoin magazine article that I wrote, I believe, back in 2013. So this is like literally more than 10-year-old content, and it's pretty scary content. Um, last night, around 9 p.m. PDT, I clicked a link to go to coinchat.freetsy.com, and I was prompted to run Java. I did, thinking this was a legitimate chat room, and nothing happened. I closed the window and thought nothing of it. I opened my Bitcoin QT wallet approximately 14 minutes later, and I saw a transaction that I did not approve, go to wallet, one E um, S3 QVVK and one QAP P6 ME7 J L C V M Z P Q X V X dot PNTC for almost my entire wallet, dot, uh, dot, dot, dot. So this is the sort of stuff that happens to people, right? Um, this person uh, unfortunately only lost 2.07 Bitcoins, um, so, at the time, it wasn't that much, but today it's worth a huge amount, right? Um, in other, but other people lost even more. All in vain lost 25,000 BTC, right? Imagine, you know, who here wants 25,000 BTC? Imagine having 25,000 BTC, and then suddenly you don't know what happens, but your balance just drops to zero. This is stuff that's actually happened, right? So wallet security is like pretty scary, and people's wallets getting stolen is scary, and people losing their wallets is also scary. Stefan Thomas lost his wallet despite having multiple backups. My preferred solution to this stuff is multi-sig and social recovery, right? Wallets that, instead of having one key, have multiple keys. Uh, so this is, I mean, this is actually like how I store most of, uh, most of my money. This is also how the Ethereum Foundation stores most of its money. You have a wallet, and you have multiple keys, and most of the, those keys are all controlled by different people. And you, let's say you need, in the case of the Ethereum Foundation, you need four out of those seven people to approve a transaction, right? So it does make things less efficient, but for huge amounts of money and for amounts of money that are people's life savings, you know, the cost is actually worth it, right? And so. You know, these are seven people that are in different places around the world. If you want, you can actually go one level of security higher and say you don't even need the seven guardians to know, to know each other, right? You don't even need any one of these key holders to know who the other key holders are. And that's like even more protection against them trying to collude with each other. Um, so 
basically in wallets that have multiple signatures where each individual key, some of the keys could be controlled by different devices that you have. Some of the keys could be controlled by other people. Some of the keys could be controlled by, institu by institutions, right? Any, as long, basically any combination, as long as it gets us away from this really horrible approach where you have one key and if you do something wrong with that one key, you're completely screwed. So multisig basically says you have seven keys or you have some number of keys and you need, like for example, four of them to do anything. Social recovery is like a milder version that says you have one wallet and with that wallet you have one main key. That one main key can do things, but then if you lose that one key, then four out of seven can recover that key. So I'm a big fan of both. Like I think multisig is good for cold wallets and uh, social recovery is good for hot wallets. Um, but and there's some actually, so social recovery wallets, and the, there's been a lot of very good progress in making multisig and social recovery happen, right? So who here has heard of ERC-4337? Yeah. Account abstraction, right? Basically, yeah, it's a, a set of Ethereum standards that makes it much easier to have a, yeah, an, account, an account where the rules for verifying transactions are smart contract code. And so your account does not have to be protected by one key. Your account can be protected by three keys, it can be protected by seven keys. You can even have rules for changing the keys. You can have rules for revoking uh, keys. You can even have rules that say, you need one key to spend up to $1,000 uh, and four keys to spend more than $1,000. You can do all kinds of things. Now, from the user's perspective, right, Social recovery, like in my opinion, it's great. And in my opinion, like this category of solutions is by far the best way to like actually have security for people's wallets. But there are user experience challenges. Users have many accounts. Um, and one reason why users are gonna have many accounts is because there's many L2s, right? A lot of people are gonna have accounts on Optimism and on Arbitrum and on Kakarot and you know, everywhere, right? And um, if you, what happens if you lose your key? Like, do you have to go and recover every single account on every single layer two at the same time? You know, do you have to pay all of those transaction fees? What about counterfactual accounts, right? Like, you can, Ethereum has this feature, and Bitcoin, like, and basically most blockchains have this feature that we don't really think about, but it's super important, which is like, you can send people coins before those people have sent a transaction, right? Like, I can generate an address locally, and you can send me coins to that address before I actually send a transaction. And like, the system has to work this way, right? Because if that feature did not exist, then like, how would I even send the transaction? Like, how would I even pay a fee to send that, to send that transaction? But what happens, uh, so what about accounts that you generated locally and that you have not used, right? Like imagine you generate a counterfactual account, like you generate your private public key pair, and this account is a social recovery account, and there is a copy of it on three different L2s, but you actually use it on one, you use it on another, but you don't use it on a third, and you don't use it on five more. And then someone sends you coins on one of those five more, and then, well, like which key actually is needed to send the transaction, right? Like there's a lot of these really weird and confusing user experience trade-offs, and these are things that a lot of the yeah, smart contract wallet people are really trying to deal with right now. And finally, what about privacy, right? So, like, I've done some, some surveying myself, and I basically asked people, why don't you use Gnosis Safe or something similar to store all of your money today? The biggest answer is privacy. Like, they did not, even if they trusted their family and friends to not literally steal their money, they still did not want their family and friends to see every single transaction that they make and every single asset that they have, right? So can you have a social recovery system or a multisig without needing to, or in a way that makes sure that the guardians don't actually see what they're guarding? Or, and in a way that the guardians don't see each other's identities. You actually can, but it involves some pretty hard math. So problem three, privacy. So cash payments have been a basic feature of human civilization for thousands of years, right? Ca you know, cash has basically been the way that most in-person uh, commerce has happened. And privacy is a human right, and um, privacy you know, in payments, 
we haven't even needed to talk about it as a right because it's just been a default, right? For 3,000 years of human history, there hasn't been a way to have anything other than a form of cash that actually has privacy. Now, hmm. digitization is, uh, you know, rapidly eroding our privacy in pretty much every sphere, right? And I know that, like, normally I'm not really a fan of bashing the World Economic Forum, and, like, I think people sometimes go too hard on them, and they're like, you know, they're a forum, they're not, like, the secret guys that control everything, but, you know, in that forum, sometimes they say things that are pretty scary. And like this is, uh, you know, this line, welcome to 2030, I own nothing, I have no privacy, and life has never been better. Like, I think it's up there, and I think it's kind of representative of, uh, you know, this kind of mentality that I think is co too common and kind of worrying. And it's, uh, ba the, basically, it's like the default direction that, unfortunately, I expect digitization to take unless we try really hard to actually make sure that digitization takes a better direction, right? Digitized systems, by default, don't have privacy. You have to like add cryptography on top and you have to like actually try to make the digitized system private. The central bank digital currency proposals that I've seen, more generally, they don't really have like real privacy, right? Like they yeah, sometimes pay lip service to it, but like in reality, the central bank could see everything that each person is transacting, right? And even outside of privacy, like if you use identities, right? Like Google can see everything that you're logging into, you know? It's uh, like basically every single app that is being created, it's like by default it's being created in a way that has no privacy. And like this many different forms of privacy all across the spectrum that, that have just been an unthought and a kind of unconsidered default that everyone has assumed exists as part of our civilization are just rapidly falling off a cliff. And I think the crypto space is possibly one of the very few spaces, po possibly the only space that is in any kind of position to actually offer the world a realistic alternative to this. Um, now, there's problems on the other side too, right? So if we think about the privacy of cash, it's easy to anonymously move $1,000 but moving a billion dollars is harder, right? Now, with digital cash, well, it turns out that, you know, m digital stuff is slippery, and it's like very, it's as easy to move a billion dollars as it is to move a thousand dollars, right? And like, this is actually a challenge, right? Like, it's uh, like digital privacy at the, like, or privacy of cash transactions at the very top end of the scale, you know, it does also end up ca uh, causing a whole bunch of problems, and so, there was this, this is a, a slogan by him, you know, from Julian Assange, right? And uh, he basically said, uh, you know, that the ideal world from the cypherpunk point of view is a world that has privacy for the weak and transparency for the powerful. So can we have a world where privacy for, you know, small amounts of money and privacy for just regular transactions is an actual reality and like really a reality like not some like stupid fake privacy where there's actually a back door real privacy no back doors like only you see the things that you're supposed to see but at the same time you know especially for the largest of the edge of the transactions have like some have some kind of uh, tr of transparency and uh, traceability especially yeah, you know in cases where something that like everyone agrees is a, is a hack or a theft happened for example so we actually, there's actually a lot of interesting research in making something like this possible, right? I think uh, one of the things that people keep chronically underestimating about zero-knowledge proofs is just how powerful the technology is, right? Like people think about, sometimes people think about cryptography as being this technology that does complete anonymity. And sometimes people think about cryptography as this technology that like enables total verification and tracing. But the reality is like zero knowledge proofs are really powerful and they let you engineer incredibly clever combinations of both at the same time. So the proof of innocence protocol, this is a, a really fascinating example. Basically the way that this works is uh, we imagine a mixer, right? So something that works like Tornado Cash, people put their coins in and coins come out. Now let's imagine that you as an individual depositor wants to prove that, that your coins are just, let's say you just want to prove that your coins did not come from, from a scam or, your, or, or from a hack or from 
you know, something that's clearly associated with North Korea, right? And that's all, and you want to prove that without actually publicly revealing, um, you know, the link between the coins you're taking out and the coins that you're putting in. It turns out that you can, right? You make a zero knowledge proof that says, I'm one of these three and I'm not one of these two. And this is something that can be automated, right? And you can make a system where by default, everyone that participates in one of these privacy systems, they make a proof that proves that, you know, they are not one of the Azure, one, the, the payment that they're taking out is not one of the payments that came in from, you know, crypto scam DB or like one of the yeah, official lists of uh, transactions that get flagged as suspicious. And, um, you know, they yeah, get a very high degree of privacy. And then the people that actually are associated with these thefts, well, they're not going to be able to make this kind of proof because, well, they are one of the hacks deposits. And so they are going to get a much smaller set of people that they're mixing their coins with, right? And so this is like one example of something where people have privacy by default, but like if the, if the uh, ecosystem coordinates around kind of boycotting the coins that come out of a of, that are associated with a particular set of events, they are able to do that. And the amount of other coins that those, uh, that those coins are able to mix themselves with suddenly becomes much smaller, right? And so suddenly, if you steal a billion dollars, well, there's a lot more friction associated with trying to move that, bi that billion dollars anywhere further, right? And um, this is something that a bunch of different development teams are working on, right? So there's the yeah, Chainway team, there's, uh, I mean, Amin Soleimani, who, uh, you know, helped instigate the original Tornado Cash, um, you know, he's got privacy pools, continuing to do some great work on this. There's uh, actually a bunch of projects that are, start, uh, that are starting to go in this direction. And like, I think this is one, a really, just like a really interesting educational story of like how zero knowledge proofs can like actually give us, you know, privacy for the people and at the same time, like these like more complicated security and uh, verification guarantees at the same time, right? Like you can prove that you're not one of the bad guys without revealing everything about yourself. And that's something that's really powerful. That's something that was uh, not really available to us before. Other kinds of privacy, right? So I think just the ability to like move coins around without creating a link between every single action that you do is like the simplest kind of privacy that people have come up with. There's other kinds of privacy too. So let's say we have Bob and Bob is receiving assets. And the, the way that this happens if we're doing an in-person conversation is Alice asks, hey, what's your address? And Bob gives his ENS name, bob.eth. Or maybe it's, uh, you know, bob.optinames.eth or, or bob. you know, whatever other layer two names.eth, right? But the problem is that if Bob does this, then he's doxing his own name and he's doxing the connection between his own name and all, all of the actors that he's interacting with. If Alice has a .eth name, then he's even creating a public on-chain link between Bob and Alice. And so the question is, how do we hide the link between Alice and Bob? And how do we even hide the total assets that Bob received? Stealth addresses. So this is something that I think Tony uh, Varstader will be talking about a bit later today. But it's um, you know, this uh, powerful technology uh, for basically letting Bob receive money in such a way that, like what it basically does is it lets each, every other person generate an address where that address is controllable by Bob, but without a public link on chain between Bob and that address, right? So uh, instead of give, instead of Bob.eth linking to Bob's address, Bob.eth would link to something that's called Bob's meta address. And a meta, meta address is like this, this cryptographic key that you can go and you can take that cryptographic key, combine it with data that you control, and then create an, an address which is controllable by Bob and which is totally unlinkable to any of the addresses that Bob has, right? So another example of privacy, and like this is something that totally can, uh, you know, can be done, is being done. There's uh, already teams that are working on it. And like, this is another really important thing, right? Like if you imagine, you know, a charity, like, or, you know, political activist group, you know, wants to collect funds, like that's, it do, you don't necessarily want to like dox each and every person who, uh, who, sent, uh, uh, who sent money to that organization, right? 
And um, you know, with stealth addresses, you actually can improve some privacy there. Um, can we make social recovery privacy preserving? This is a fun one, right? So imagine you have notes that are coins that are inside of a privacy system, and you want to, at the same time, have a recovery system. So if you lose your key, you can switch the key to something else. Well, this seems unsolvable, right? It's like you want to give other your guardians the ability to change the key, but then at the same time, like you want to you want to not create a link between all of your different assets. Well, it turns out that we can, right? So ZK social recovery. The basic trick is we separate the concept of an address with, that holds assets with the concept of a key store, right? So a key store is going to have logic for the what is the spending key and what it, what are the rules for changing the key. If you want to recover, you do things with the key store. And then your assets are going to be in separate addresses, right? And if you want to spend from one of your addresses, you provide a zero knowledge proof. That zero knowledge proof it contains a pointer to the key store, but that pointer is a private input. So the computation of verifying that you're authorized to spend your assets according to the current conditions in your current key store today, all of that logic is done privately inside of a zero knowledge proof. Right, so it doesn't actually get revealed to the outside world. So, you know, conclusion, right? So, Zream, ZK Starks rule everything around me. Um, ZK Starks are like this super important technology that is enabling pretty much basically everything that I talked about, right? So, scalability, ZK rollups. Um, so, you know, Kakarot, Linnea, um, you know, ZK Sync, Polygon, all of this stuff depend on ZK Snarks. Privacy. Um, depends on ZK Snarks. Social recovery at the same time as privacy enables even more clever ZK Snarks, right? Um, you know the people who were who were in Zuzulu before this. Um, you know ZooPass, the yeah, and uh, you know ZooPoll, the zero knowledge voting system, dependent on Snarks, right? So we have identity systems that preserve privacy depend on Snarks, right? So you know ZK Snarks are basically this technology that's like as I, like, I think there, it's, it's as powerful as blockchains, and it's going to be as important as blockchains uh, going, going forward in the next 10 years, right? So that's kind of an overview of the, yeah, te of the main technological paths that I'm seeing happen over the next 10 years. And I think the interesting thing about this is that the problems that we're solving are basically the same as the problems that I talked about in that slide that I gave in Taiwan at the end of 2017, right? Privacy, scalability, security, same sort of, you know, okay, fine, we solve proof of stake, we still have the other three, right? The problems are very similar, but the solutions are, I think, they've advanced a lot, and I think the biggest advancement is just how they've moved from theory to practice, right? Like, are any of, those, are any of the, these things possible? Someone in 2017 could have said yes, but in 2017, like, we did not know when like ZK tech that's you powerful enough for people to actually use is going to come, right? Like in 2017, I mean, I personally thought that, you know, ZK EVMs were like at least 10 years away. Then, you know, probably, probably like 15 years away. Six years later, we have running ZK EVMs on mainnet, right? It's like, uh, you know, ZK snarks are probably, as like aside from uh, transformers, they're like the one technology that's like actually shooting way ahead of people's expectations, right? And I think it's uh, kind of important and healthy to, you know, reevaluate and e like in, a, uh, in an optimistic direction just how much we can do if we like actually use all of these, uh, all of these technologies properly. And it turns out that like we could do quite a lot, right? Like we can actually make blockchains that are much cheaper so transaction fees would be able to, you know, be back below five cents again. We can have applications that preserve people's privacy, and not just for like financial privacy, but also privacy for identity systems, reputations, um, you know, all of this social recovery stuff, like everything. Uh, we're going to, you know, we can actually have like account systems that are much safer, and we can basically get to the point where fully decentralized technology, like, actually is comparable on a pure user experience basis to what centralized systems offer today. And I think decentralized technology, we could actually make it superior to what centralized systems offer today. And so, once we have that, then, like, 
people will actually be, like even the kinds of people that really depend on blockchains uh, today are going to actually be able to use blockchains without needing to use centralized intermediaries, right? And at the, I think that's powerful, and I think that's really important, and I think like it's amazing that we are, that there is like actually so much more clarity now around the paths in all in each of these individual directions than there was even two or five years ago, right? But the challenge is like there's just a whole bunch of technical work that needs to be done, and there's like a whole bunch of people that needs to actually keep working together, right? Like. Um, you know, who here is um, actively develop part developing an Ethereum wallet? Um, who here is uh, talking to everyone else that, that just raised their hand? Sure, the question is, who here is currently actively part of a team that is building an Ethereum wallet? Who here, okay, so second question, who here is t already talking to all of the other people that have raised their hand. Okay, basically, yeah, okay, see, so a couple, which is good, right? But I think we need more, right? Like, if, we, if we're talking about, like, getting Ethereum across through the layer two transition and through the privacy transition, like, this is something that requires standardization, right? This is something that requires wallet builders to be working together on. This is uh, something that requires ENS and applications to be working together on existing stuff that exists, like applications, like lots of applications don't support smart contract wallets. Lots of applications don't support ERC-1271, which is how you do off-chain signatures for everything that is not a basic, e basic EOA, right? Um, lots of applications, they don't even, like they're not even standards compatible. Like they only support MetaMask and they don't support other wallets because of like just one tiny thing and like their testers did not even think of testing it in Brave, right? Like there's still a lot of these little things that have to be solved and like even more of those things are going to have to be solved in the future. Um, so there is like a really important need for I think people in the Ethereum ecosystem to keep collaborating and working together even more as we get through all of these technical transitions that are needed to actually like take all of these theoretical technical benefits and turn them into you know, properties of Ethereum that regular users coming into the ecosystem for the first time actually get to benefit from and use, right? It's easy to make an alpha. It's much more difficult to actually standardize something across the entire ecosystem, right? And I think that's probably one of the big, still one of the big social challenges that the uh, ecosystem has left, right? Like we, uh, we talk a lot about coordination and we talk a lot about fun funding public goods and funding public goods is super important, but then there is also just coordinating on making sure that we're on the same page in terms of up upgrading protocols. Layer one is pretty good at doing this. The application layer, you know, it's uh, sometimes good, sometimes less good, but and um, I think it can be built, can be much better, right? And so, you know, that's my like the dream that I have for the Ethereum ecosystem is as we continue building all of this amazing tech, and uh, you know, as we continue turning privacy and scaling and security and all of these other things into solved problems that we can you know, actually work together and like actually make sure that you know, we preserve Ethereum's core values of decentralization, openness, censorship resistance, permissionlessness, border borderlessness, and actually create a, you know, an ecosystem where we do all these things collaboratively and, um, you know, we work, and we work together and uh, you know, we uh, actually, uh, you know, create a, uh, you know, a beautiful Ethereum stack where all of these uh, problems are actually solved for, uh, for people five years from now, um, you know, no matter which L2 you're on and uh, no matter which wallet you're using. So, thank you. Mm.